everyone welcome back to my channel today is a very special day because I always read I don't know I am really crazy history person so I'm always reading like on this day I get these emails that tell me like history on this day and they just always fascinate me and I have interviewed so many authors about um, history and historical fiction and because I love it more than anything and when I saw what today was, I was like, oh my God, I have to talk about it because I am a crazy Romanov history person. I love reading books about the Romanovs, okay? So today we're going to talk about this book. I'm going to put the interview that I had with Helen Rappaport up. But the reason we're doing that today is because today is the day that Nicholas II and Alexandra got married back in 1894. And it's really interesting. Like I saw that little fact and then I was like, oh, I wonder what happened with their wedding. So I look it up on Wikipedia and I found out all this crazy stuff about their wedding. And you're going to read about it in this book too, but I don't remember. I talked to Helen a long time ago and I haven't listened to it in a while. And I don't know how much we talked about their wedding, but here, let me just give you a little bit and then I'll, and then I'll let this go and I'll, you know, let you listen to the video. Uh, I had talked to her on the phone. She's in England. And uh, we had a, oh my God, it was like a dream come true for me. Seriously. She is amazing. And she writes about the Romanovs. I don't even know how many books she has written about the Romanovs, but this is the one that we talked about and the one that I read. So their wedding day. Okay. November 26th, 1894. And in April of that year, he had asked Alex to marry him. And she said, no. She didn't want to change religions because she would have to become Russian Orthodoxy and she didn't want to do that. And for all of you who don't know this, she was Queen Victoria's granddaughter. Okay. So, you know, her Queen Victoria comes up to her, you know, it's your grandmother and she, and she's queen, <laughs> she's queen of England. And she says, um, guess what? You are going to marry Nicholas because you have no choice and it's part of your duty to the country. And, you know, because back then, you know, monarchs are all over Europe and, and they like to keep England, like to keep people everywhere. And she was like, you're going to, he wants to marry you. You are going to marry him. So imagine your grandmother saying that to you. I, I can't even imagine. My, I loved my grandmother so much and they would never have said that, but they weren't queen of England. Okay. So she says, you're marrying Nicholas. And she was like, okay. So Nicholas asks her again. And that was in April, I think April 19th. Yeah. April 19th. So she, he asks her again. She says, yes. So usually it, they would take like a year. So they were planning on getting married in 1895, but Nicholas's dad dies November 1st. Okay. Making Nicholas the czar of Russia at 26 years old. So all of a sudden, you know, he's engaged, he's planning a wedding and his dad dies. And now he finds out, okay, I'm czar. What am I, what are we going to do? You know? So he has a little conversation with his mom and his mom says, yes, you guys should get married before the funeral. The funeral was supposed to be at the end of November, November 30th, I think. So they push up the wedding to November 26th. It's like not even, you know, usually royal weddings were huge. And, you know, I'm going to show a picture of their wedding. Um, you'll be looking at right there. And, um, but it wasn't no honeymoon, nothing, no reception. I don't even think they had a reception. No, no reception, no honeymoon. And they get to live with his mom. You know, what? she's like, I married the czar of Russia and I don't get a reception. And I don't get a honeymoon and I'm moving in with the mom. I can't even imagine how she, <laughs> I, whatever. Anyway, you know, the way their, the way their life together started and we know how it ended, which wasn't good. They had 24 years of marriage, but it wasn't fun. For a lot of it, maybe some of it was a little fun, but I don't know. Anyway, I love history. I loved that I found out all this stuff about their wedding. And I was like, you know what? Just replay that video because Helen is amazing. And she's continued to write books. And this book was so good. Okay. And I loved it so much. I, I read it like I read it when it came out. And then when I got to talk to her, I read it again. And in the meantime, I've read lots and lots of Romanoff books, but anyway, enjoy the video and have an amazing Monday. Thanks everyone.
Hi, everybody. Today I have with me historian and author Helen Rappaport. Helen has published at least 13 books specializing in Russian and English history, and she has a book coming out today in the United States called Caught in the Revolution. And I'm so happy to have you here with me, Helen. I have so many questions for you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I, you know, I I told you in your email that I was really um, caught up in the the Romanov sisters. I bought yes. this book uh, a little while ago. I have the book, and then I listened to the audio, and I was so uh, <laughs> so caught up in it. And I had finished it. I'd read it through twice, and then I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy Victoria. And now I am. I've watched the miniseries. And I am just in love with Victoria. So <laughs> you've, you've brought me a whole new world, and I'm so grateful for that. Well, thank you. I mean, it's interesting, really, because I never intended to be, I suppose, a royal historian. I suppose I am writing about Victoria and the Romanovs, but it was kind of by accident rather than design. But um, there is so much interest in, in them and so much enthusiasm, particularly for the story of those four lovely Romanov sisters that um, I fortunately fell on my feet by choosing them as subjects. And I I saw the book in the bookstore, and I lo- I'm a history buff, okay? So when I saw the cover, I was like, oh, I've heard of them, but I don't really know their story. So when I got the book, I was, you know, I was like, oh, my gosh, why did I not learn about this in history? You know, why, well, why, how did that, how did they skip over this, you know? Well, it, it's very simple. The girls, really, effectively, were always the pretty set dressing. They were in the background, the pretty girls in big picture hats and white dresses looking very beautiful and not much else. And, um, you know, they, they, were, they were never considered a, of any real importance, the important child, of course, was their brother, the heir to the throne, who was also a haemophiliac. But as such, the girls were kind of almost footnotes in the story. And that's that's exactly why I wanted to tell their story. I thought they'd been overlooked by history. And all too often, they're referred to as this kind of anonymous collective with no sense of um, the individual personalities of the girls. So First thing I wanted to do, really, was give them back their identities. Uh, and you've done that beautifully. Uh, the woman who did the audio book, it was, it was so well done. I, I oh, to a lot oh of she's books. got the most wonderful voice. Yes. It's so beautiful and soothing and melancholic. It's perfect, perfect for the story. It's perfect, and she had the accent you know, that you could really feel like you were in Russia, you know, listening to a Russian woman uh, tell the story. Um, no, I, it's, yeah. a lo- it, it, it's, a, it's a lovely reading of the book. I cried yeah. when I first heard a bit of it. I really, I found it very moving the way she did it. Yes. And she gave each one of them a voice in a very nice way, you know. Mm. That's, mm. that's what I liked about it. That's you know. a real gift. Um of course, the audio of my new book's just come out, and that's a man's voice this time for the revolution in Petrograd. And I haven't yet had time to listen to it through, but he's got to struggle with quite a few different accents, including <laughs> um, including an African-American from Jefferson, Missouri. I'm not sure how he's going to cope with that one. <laughs> who, who was it? Uh, um, Phil Jordan, who was the valet mm. come chauffeur to the American ambassador, David R. Francis. Uh, well, I, I can't wait to read it. I did try to pull it up yesterday, and, of course, it's not available until today. So I would definitely, oh, you know. That's odd. Yeah, I couldn't um, even pull up the Kindle. It wasn't, it wasn't available. And I did, have, I did have a thought that I might wake up at midnight and try to download it and see what I could do, but I, it didn't happen. <laughs> oh, well, I hope you enjoy it when you can up, uh, read it. But, um I've had some nice vibes from America so far, so it was chosen in quite a few best release of the month lists, including by Harper's Bazaar and uh, New York Post at the weekend said it was essential reading, and I think you know there hopefully will be some reviews. Yeah, you have a, you have such a gift for that time frame to make us feel like we're actually there and. You know, it's very hard to do. I've read a lot of history books, a lot, 
and I love the way you write. I mean, it's I, I feel like I just got done with Victoria, the book, yesterday. That's the well, companion. The tie-in, the TV one. Yeah, the one that's tied. The, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's tied in with the pictures from the miniseries that's yeah. Um, yeah. being broadcast. And when I got it in the mail, I, I didn't know. I mean, I ordered it online. I got it in the mail, and I was like, oh, my God, this book is beautiful. I mean, it is a, I want everybody to get this book. It's beautiful. And it's just, you know, I watched, so I'm watching the miniseries and then I'm reading the book as it's going, you know, like yeah. I wanted, I didn't want to read ahead. So I'm watching the, you know, the miniseries at the same time. And, um, I am, I, I felt such a connection to Queen Victoria because I am also half English and half German and mm-hmm. I had six children. So I was thinking to myself, well, maybe if I would have been queen, like I could have had nine children. I could have just kept going, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, it, 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 I love writing about Queen Victoria and her period, the reign, as much as I do about the Romanovs, and I kind of interchange between the two. And, of course, there are sort of royal connections between the, the two family uh, houses, of course. But they're all fairly closely related, but... Um, Um, The the, the nice thing about doing the history book to tie in with the TV series is that um, obviously there's a fair bit of dramatic license in the TV adaptation of the story, whereas my book actually gives you what really happened. Right, and that and that I love that you did put that in the book. That the differences that they had to make in the you know miniseries for whatever reason they did. Um, Sometimes Mm. they do it just for you know, TV viewing, but I did love that you pointed out the differences in that. Yeah, you know? it's important because, um, I, I, you know, it's very difficult being a historian and working in TV drama. You have to <laughs> wear, you have to wear two different hats, really, because when, when I write history, I'm extremely um, scrupulous about checking my facts and that everything should stack up. But TV history is different. You have to convey a sense of the story and capture a moment and or an attitude or a relationship. And you can't do that by slavishly adhering to facts. Often things have to be kind of, uh, you have to encapsulate things. You have to fiddle slightly with the chronology, which happens in Victoria. You have to put people together who aren't, weren't actually in the same room at that particular point in time. And it, it's to create TV drama. You can't, you can't just do a straight oh, education of, of what happened. You've got to make it dramatic. So, there right. are, you know, there are some parts of the story that are more kind of um, fictionalized than others. Yes, and I love how in the back of the book you also take us into the making of the miniseries. And, mm. you know, because I, I thought they did such a good job. I mean, you know. Oh, the, 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 the crew and the designer. The designer's done a uh, marvelous job. Uh, he had to recreate that great long passageway with all the candles, the corridor in King uh, Palace, um, because obviously they couldn't. They couldn't film at any of the royal palaces at all. And so that was all recreated on a big set in North Yorkshire. And they used one or two um, country mansions and houses for certain scenes or bits in the grounds. But basically, they had to recreate the interiors of of Buckingham Palace entirely um, from scratch. Yeah, and and when you saw the costumes, and then when you described like how they made all of these costumes, because they're just so well done, you know. They're, they're oh beautiful. yeah, I think I love I love the wigs too. Oh they're yes, wonderful twirly hairstyles. But I thought Victoria's dresses in particular were delightful, and she's so dainty and pretty, Jenna oh. Coleman. I don't know how they're going to cope as Victoria gets. Fatter and fatter and older <laughs> and but more and more of a boring dresser. But um, they had she had some beautiful things to wear. Yes, yeah, she, she definitely fits. You know, I, I thought she did a beautiful job. What, what a great actress! Oh, she's but marvelous. I, you see, yeah. for me, what really matters in television is okay. She's far too pretty for Queen Victoria, but she's <laughs> almost the right height. She's a little bit taller, but certainly not much taller as Emily Blunt was. 
But the important thing is that whichever actress plays part um, conveys the spirit, the personality yeah. of the young queen. And I think Jenna captures Victoria in a way that no other actress has done. The very young, feisty, impetuous mm-hmm. um, young queen who makes mistakes and has to learn. And um, I, th- I think she does an absolutely wonderful job. And all her scenes with um, with Melbourne, played by Rosa Sewell, are absolutely magical. Oh. Magical, oh. you know. They, yeah. they, that was the chemistry between those two in their scenes was just beautiful. And also with Tom Hughes as Albert. Yes, I, I loved all of the actors. I thought they, you know. I, I thought it's they very well cast. Very well cast. Very well cast, yeah. Very, yes. So I have a couple of questions to connect the two time frames. Um, so I know that Victoria was related. You know, I know that the the, the Romanovs and the and and the England was related through the Romanovs' mother, Queen. Um, did they call her Queen? Or no, they called her Tsarina. Sorry. Um, well, the re- relationship really comes through Victoria's children. Um, Victoria's oh. eldest son, who became her heir. Bertie, yes. i.e. King, King Edward VII, his mother was a Danish princess called Dagmar, who married Tsar Alexander III and became Maria Fyodorovna. Now, Dagmar's Danish sister was Alexandra, who married... Um, now, wait a minute, I'm going wrong. Sorry, oh, God, start again. <laughs> the two, the two I know. Danish sisters... I'm sorry, start again. Okay. Um, King Edward VII's wife, Alexandra, was Danish. Her sister was called Dagmar, and she married Alexander III. So you have those two uh, monarchs directly related. Okay. So now, um, Edward the. I've got. I can't do it without looking at the family tree, so I get muddled up myself. So basically, um, Alexandra was the daughter of one of Queen Victoria's daughters, and King Edward VII was her uncle because he was the brother, the eldest brother of Princess Alice the Fester. So there were very close family relationships. Nicholas wasn't so closely related to the British, but he was closely related to the Danes because his Danish mother was the sister of uh, King Edward the the Seventh. Yeah, it's a it's a tough it's a tough history line, you know. It gets I, very I, complicated. I, I, mean, yes, I, them, I mean it would be simpler too. just to say that Queen Victoria, by having nine children and then a lot of grandchildren and then even more great great grandchildren, at some point somewhere most of these royal houses of Europe became interconnected. Because they all married each other. It was, there were a lot of first cousins marrying each other. It was all quite incestuous, really. Right. And and when Victoria was, I mean, one of the, Russia's, okay, so was it Nick? No, Alex was at the court. Like, he was one of her suitors. And then his parents called him back and said, no. Oh, oh no. Alexander, the, the Tsar Alexander II when he was Sergeyevich, heir to the throne, uh, his father was Nicholas I of Russia. Okay. Alexander came to the court to meet young Queen Victoria in 1839, shortly before she uh, got hooked up with Albert. Now, Alexander and Victoria actually had a real passion on each other, uh, mm-hmm. briefly. But, of course, a queen of England could never have married a future Tsar of Russia. It just wouldn't have been practical. And Russia was um, held in too much suspicion by the British anyway. Uh, You know, they were very, um, they really still saw Russia as a threat. And of course, in the 1850s, they went to war with Russia in the Crimea. So uh, any marriage to Victoria and the Tsarevich Alexander would never, ever have been allowed. But they certainly liked the look of each other briefly. Mm hmm. Yes, and he seemed very charming. They they portrayed him in the miniseries as very charming. And, oh yes, very dashing. You know, uh, yes, Dmitri Donskoy. He's he's a real Russian that actor. 
She's lovely. Yes. So Queen Victoria, she is the one who had the hemophiliac gene. Well, we don't know. On. Well, we don't oh, know. We don't know. Okay. We just don't know. All the, the closest any explanation has come is that there was a, some kind of spontaneous mutation hmm. in her genes that passed it on to her daughters. Uh, but okay. we, the, the scientists have no idea. And without digging Queen Victoria up, and running DNA tests on her bones, we'll never know. And of course right. the royals right. would never allow that. It, it suddenly appeared in some of her daughters, and then of course the daughters who were carriers passed it on to their children. So Alexander of Russia had the hemophilia gene passed on by her mother, Alice, who had mm-hmm. it passed to her by Queen Victoria. And then she passed it on. None of the none of the Romanov sisters presented with it. Just Alexei. Well, no, because actually, after the DNA tests were done recently, when they found all the missing, you know, the two sets of remains that were still missing, they ran a lot of additional tests, and it turns out out that of the four sisters, the only one who was a carrier of hemophilia was actually Anastasia. Mm. The other three sisters would have been okay. But of course, no one knew that at the time. And that's one of the reasons why at least the older two sisters had not been married off by the time war broke out and, you know, be safely out of Russia, um, was because the royal houses of Europe were terrified of having hemophilia brought in. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, they could not explain, you know, how, how it happened. And then there was no cure for it, of course. Right. Interesting, you know, because when I was watching, I watched a YouTube on it, you know, because I just wanted to have a little bit more knowledge about it. And they had said that it was Queen Victoria. And I was like, well, she, but she gave birth to nine children. If she would have had hemophilia, that, you no, know, she didn't. She didn't. She did. right. But women don't have it. They carry it. They carry it. Okay. And they pass it on. Queen Victoria didn't have any symptoms of hemophilia. We just don't know how it appeared. Yeah, um, her eldest daughter, Vicky, did, appears not to have had hemophilia or been a carrier because none of her children um, had it. Um, her daughter, the one who also suffered terribly, was her youngest daughter, Beatrice, because she passed it on to her daughter, Ina, who then took it into the Spanish royal family and had two hemophiliac sons who both died quite young. Mm. Interesting. Uh, well, another of Victoria's daughters never had children, so we don't know whether she was a carrier. I didn't um, realize that it's the women that carry it. The I women tran- it. transmit it. Uh, but I'm no expert. It's quite a difficult um, <laughs> right. uh, a scientific um, condition to understand. So don't, you know, I'm going to say don't quote me, but, um, you know, yeah, um, people just, there is no um, actual a definitive scientific explanation of how it got into the British royal family. Interesting. Well, let's talk about um, Cotton the Revolution, because I'm very interested in hearing, you know, about where that takes us through, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, after the Romanov sisters. They, they, the whole Romanov family is murdered in what year? Well, they weren't murdered until 1918. Okay. A year so after the revolution, well, more than a year after the revolution, in July. So the revolution broke, uh, uh, well, effectively, it, it, Nicholas abdicated at the beginning of March. And after that, the family were put under house arrest at their mm-hmm. palace at Saskia And they were kept there from March to the end of July, 1917. Then at the beginning of August, they were moved to Tobolsk in Western Siberia, because it was too dangerous to keep them in Petrograd. The uh, provisional government were worried the mob would attack um, the Alexander Palace and sort of take Nicholas and Alexander out and pretty much lynch them. So they were moved. And they were in Taborsk until the end of April 1918, and then they were moved to Katerinburg, where they were murdered. Hmm. 
So the, this new book starts off at the beginning of the Russian Revolution, then in 1917. Well, no, no, it, start, it starts off slightly before it, because you can't just dive in on day one of the revolution. I, I had to set the scene, and really the rumblings of revolution were there for, for years. If, if for years people have been talking that sooner or later there'd be trouble if Nicholas didn't make some compromises politically. But the real build-up, um, came in the autumn of the previous year of 1916, and um, it really culminated in the murder of Rasputin at the end of December, because um, that really was the trigger for within the Romanov family for them all to gang up against Nicholas and Alexandra uh, and start plotting, actually, because they could see that um, uh, Alexandra in particular was leading the monarchy to destruction. But the actual revolution itself broke in February in um, the streets of Petrograd. And, and it was to do with people protesting all the terrible wartime shortages, the lack of bread, the harsh working conditions, um, you know, the lack of fuel and low wages, you name it. It was very much a popular grassroots revolt by ordinary working people initially. Hmm. And it was not led by Lenin and the revolutionaries at all. It was an absolute spontaneous outpouring of dissent and, and, and lots of women on the streets marching saying, give us bread, give us bread, we cannot feed our children. Because the wartime flower shortages were absolutely terrible and they could not feed that city. Hmm. And, that, you know, that's what I was thinking. Like, he was... Did he just not understand that the people were starving? Who? Alexander, the Tsar. Oh, Alexander. Well, well, Alexander was cut off from what was really going on in the city, 15 miles away in her palace. She thought it was a lot of hot air and it would all die down. And if it got cold and snow, they'd all go back home and shut up. Um, she, she described it as a hooligan element. No, she mm. didn't take it seriously, but... Alexander was completely out of touch with the population at large. Nicholas was away, 500 miles away at the Russian front, the Eastern Front, in command of the army, mm -hmm. um, and also the intelligence and information being said, sent to him about the state of unrest in the city underplayed how bad it was, which is why Nicholas didn't go back to the city. If he'd immediately returned to Petrograd, taken control of the situation and made some concessions and got the bread organized to feed his people, and they might have been able to avert a revolution uh, in February. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because it's, a, it's kind of related to what um, Victoria went through in England. I mean, I don't know that it's as, as extreme as what was going on in Russia at that time, but she also had people, but she seemed very aware of what Victoria, Victoria's yeah. um, political challenge was the Chartists and the demand for a vote, one man, one vote, for political freedom, for the right to organize trade unions. But it was never this terrifying, visceral, um, mass movement of popular unrest as in Russia, which was right. really very, very violent when it was unleashed. But certainly the Chartists became very vocal in Victorian Britain throughout the 1840s. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they reached a point in 1848 where there was a whole succession of revolutions across Europe. It was a very um, um, turbulent time in Europe, and several monarchies fell. Victoria and Albert saw the writing on the wall. They saw the warning signs and heaved an enormous sigh of relief that their throne didn't go. But, mm -hmm. you know, they did, you know, we had a more conciliatory government here that did, you know, start bringing in reform bills and, and trying to enfranchise at least some of the male population. Right, right. It's, you know, I love, I love how you can pick out, you know, when you're, when you're researching, you know, because let's just talk about your writing for a minute. Like, when you're researching this, and putting it into a book. I, I imagine that the research is a little bit easier with the internet now, but where do you where do you start in <laughs> research? <laughs> how long is a piece of string? I mean, people always want to know how to do it. 
And you can't just walk into a library and it's all sitting there on the shelf neatly catalogued. No, it's an enormous search. You have to brainstorm. You have to know how to think laterally. You know have to know the way to search the Internet. You have to know how to do keyword search combinations to search. You need to know where to search. But, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a skill I've acquired through 20 years or more of, of writing history. You have to learn how to use your resources. But I, I would certainly say without the um, Internet, I could never have accessed the amount of material I have done. And the biggest boon, of course, for all historians, is digitization of newspapers because um, newspapers help you reconstruct a story as it happened in primary sources as opposed to secondary ones. So uh, without all these huge um, search engines for all the different newspapers, my task would have been, well, impossible in a short space of time. It would have taken a lifetime to write mm. one book <laughs> in the way I've written it. Yes, and, and I loved in Victoria how you had the copies of her letters because I'm sure that her diaries and letters, the fact that they would have been preserved, helped immensely in putting together the pieces of her childhood and early and and later, you know, but I Oh well, sure. well Victoria's a gift. Victoria is an absolute gift because she wrote probably about a hundred volumes of diaries which were then transcribed, edited, redacted, actually, because there's a fair bit of censorship. Victoria's is one of the, the great um, diaries of the 19th century. And without that diary and a huge volume of letters, particularly the letters she wrote to her, her eldest daughter in Prussia, um, there isn't a topic that she didn't pass some kind of comment on. Uh, and it, her, 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 her reign and her thoughts on every issue under the sun are incredibly well documented. Mm. Um, so um, you have a wealth of sources for Victoria, an absolute wealth. But unfortunately with the Romanovs, an awful lot of their diaries and letters um, were destroyed because um, at the Alexander Palace after the revolution uh, and before they were moved to Tobolsk, Alexander sat for days on end systematically burning all her letters from Queen Victoria, oh. all the letters she'd ever received from Nicholas from the day they met. Um, you know, she destroyed all her diaries up until the last diary for 1917-18, which, of course, is preserved because it was there in the house the night they were murdered. But we have lost a massive amount mm. in terms of... And the girls, the girls destroyed most of their own diaries and letters too. Luckily, there are some survivals. But um, a huge amount has disappeared. Yeah, that is such a shame. It's you know that that had to happen because that. But it's but always you're... the way. <laughs> With every book I write, I always get oh. excited because so and so kept a diary, or somebody wrote letters, and I know that those documents were there, and and I go herring off in all directions trying to find out where they are, only to discover they were burnt by a widow or an. Oh. Or some later descendants, or something went up in smoke in the bombing in the war. You know, I've had so many false trails like that. Well, yeah, I'm I'm sure you have, and and I just what I love about um, history books like yours is that when you're taking, you know, where you go for your research and you're like condensing it into something that actually makes sense in a story, you know, and it reads like a novel, which is, you know. Well, that's, uh, that's very kind of you because if there's one thing I like to do with my books is in order to make history interesting and engaging for the lay reader, you have to make it readable. And history is story. Mm -hmm. And um, exactly. that doesn't mean I go off and make it up, but there are an awful lot of very dry and boring history books out there which yes. are just a recitation of facts and dates. Mm-hmm. Yes. And my, my, that's not the way I want to do it. I have to take my reader to the place where it happened. I have to give them a sense of what it felt like. You know, what did it feel like walking up and down the Nevsky Prospect in, in Petrograd in 1917? What was the atmosphere like? You know, what was the weather like? What would, what would you see? What would you hear? You have to 
take your reader to the place and give them a sense of the atmosphere of a story, not just saying this happened, that happened, she wrote to him, he said this, you know, she said that. You've got to, you've got to fill in the background. You've got to give them a set dressing, a kind of verbal set dressing to the story. Yes. And that's what makes it so readable, and and that's why you can get so involved in these stories, because it isn't just throwing out dates and facts, because those just get, you, you can't remember those. But when you hear about, um, like what you did with the Romanov sisters, and you hear about their different personalities, and who they were, and what was going on for them, you know, you really start to understand and have compassion for what they were going through. Well, I think also, I mean... For me as a historian, it's always about the human story. It's never really about the politics. Because mm. in the end, the human beings at the end of the chain are the ones who suffer the consequences of political action and political decisions. So I, I kind of disassociate Petrograd in 1917 quite a bit from the politics because it's all very well what Lenin was thinking and doing and saying in exile and what all these Bolsheviks and revolutionaries were arguing about in the Tauri Palace. But, you know, on the street, people were queuing the freezing cold to get food. People were diving into snowdrifts to avoid stray bullets. People were hungry. They were cold. They were suffering. And that's the story for me, not about dry political arguments. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And I went on your website today, and I found that you're writing another book, and it's about the race to save the Romanovs. Well, it's yes, this was a quite a short, uh, short notice. I made this decision at quite short notice because I hadn't intended to write another Romanov book, but there's one part of that story that has always niggled me, and this is why didn't anyone save them? Why couldn't right. all those royal relatives they had all over Europe combine or do enough to get them out. Why didn't the Allied governments with whom Russia was fighting a war do something to help? And it strikes me as a terrible um, collective failure to save that family, particularly the children. And, um, of course, what, little, what has been written about it usually devolves to condemnation of King George and saying it was all his fault. He offered asylum and then got cold feet and changed his mind. Well, actually, it is a much, much more complex story than that. And I want to tell that story and um, bring in a lot of other strands of the story that have never really been written about because till now no one's really pulled all the pieces of the jigsaw together because it's taking a lot of research in eight different languages all over the world in, and I'm pulling together very scattered sources for this book. So it's going to be a real challenge. And also, I think it will be more of a kind of detective story. Yeah, which that's what I... I, I, I which time. I will analyze the evidence to, my, to the best of my ability. And, and, it's in, and I was so happy when I saw that because the whole time you're reading the Romanov sisters, in my mind, I'm going, okay, I know communication is slow. I mean, we know that the communication was slow at that time, but wasn't there somebody in all of Europe that knew that they were in prison and that it was not going to end? Oh, no, the families knew, knew where they were. I mean, they knew they were in prison. They knew they were suffering. Words and messages got out by fair, fair means and foul. The royal families knew they were suffering, but you see, you have to remember, um, in 1917, um, the world had been at war for almost four years. Everyone was tied up with the Western Front and just wanting to get to the end of this dreadful war. Every nation involved in the story was in different, to different degrees preoccupied with their own domestic problems, with staying in the war, with you know, dealing with the awful losses, military losses. And, um, and, and in a way, once the, once the Romanovs were moved out of Petrograd, in all that long distance away into Siberia, it becomes a case of out of sight, out of mind. They get, mm. they got forgotten, really. And also, people were complacent. They were terribly complacent. The royal relatives and government. I, I don't think it ever crossed anyone's mind that anyone would harm them, or certainly not the children. Okay, maybe in the back of people's minds was the possibility 
that eventually Nicholas might be tried and executed, or even Alexandra. But in their wildest thoughts, I don't think anyone contemplated the idea of, of all the family being slaughtered. So that's why, in a way, nothing was done. People drifted off and lost interest and thought, oh, it'll be all right. Let, let's just sit it out till the war's over, and then they can quietly tiptoe off into exile. Hmm. And was the world okay with Lenin taking over? Was that, and I'm, that, I'm talking from a very naive because I have not read this book yet, and, you know, I'm not really oh, was good the world about okay? Well, it, I can't give you an entire summary of what world opinion was, but it's interesting to see that when the February Revolution, this popular grassroots um, revolution driven by serious grievances, some very valid grievances, you know, um, when that broke, a huge number of the eyewitnesses I, d I write about in my book welcomed the revolution because they'd all been saying for months and months and months, there's trouble, the Tsar, if he doesn't do something soon, his government will fall and he jolly well deserves it because he's been too much of a despot, too autocratic, too resistant to change. So you get it's a very interesting contrast because initially, you know, not just the socialist-minded people in Petrograd, but even some of the diplomats said, well, you know, maybe it's a good thing a new government will take over, there'll be reform, there'll be a democratic government, and, and you know, the people will be liberated from this oppressive Tsarist regime. But of course, as time moves on and the people become more and more weary with the disruption, the continuing disruption throughout, right through the summer, there's all this talk, oh, Lenin's going to come, Lenin's going to come, well, he came back. And the minute Lenin was back in the city, he began dictating a Bolshevik um, push on, the, on taking power. And then once they take power in October, which was an absolute walkover, everyone was waiting for this predicted walkover of the Bolsheviks, and it happened really without hardly anyone being killed. Once the Bolsheviks get into power, there's this growing sense of absolute horror among many of the eyewitnesses who greeted the February Revolution because they see very quickly that this terrible new dictatorship of the Bolsheviks, some called it a bayonetocracy, this terrifying, arbitrary, rough justice was just, if not more oppressive than the Tsar mm -hmm. they just got rid of. And so um, by the end of the year, people are horrified mm. at, at what this new revolution has brought on the Russian people. And they leave the country and they see the poor Russian people still struggling, still starving, still queuing in the streets for every commodity. So um, you see a really powerful growing sense of disenchantment um, throughout the year um, because no one really knew what Lenin and the Bolsheviks were going to bring with, with their acquisition of power. But they found out pretty damn quick, and it was horrible. That's what I was wondering is like, you know, were they looking for him to be their savior from, you know, from starvation? And then it turned and then what they didn't realize was that that was not what was going to happen. You know, I was well, wondering. Well, I don't like, know about that... Lenin per se, but I mean, of course, the people were hopeful in February that a change of government uh, uh, would bring change, would bring mm -hmm. new political freedoms that they'd organize food and that. Uh, Put the, government, uh, put the country back on its feet. But of course, the provisional government um, had too much opposition from the workers and uh, revolutionaries of the Petrograd Soviet, which was a very extreme revolutionary grouping. Um, I mean, I don't think anyone thought Lenin was going to wave a magic wand, but they suddenly hoped that the Bolsheviks would feed them Mm -hmm. And if anything, the food shortages were just as bad by the end of the year, if not worse. And of course, right. the next thing they have is not only that, um, they then have a civil war which ends on for three years and in which 11 million people died. It's a right. horrific, horrific story. Horrific. Of suffering. Yeah. Yeah, that, and I don't think that story, you know, especially in my history class, was... Every, anywhere near as, you know, p 
paid attention to. You know, it was, it was very much brushed over in my generation of history. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, then the Russians went through that little thing. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you know, the Civil kind of War end. was vicious. Right. Yeah, no. Um, uh, it really was a hideous, hideous war. There was terrible brutality on both sides, actually. Yes. I know, so, stuck in the middle of it all, where the poor, ordinary people just trying to get on with their lives. Yeah, well, yes, that's the very sad part, was how many people starved in Russia during that time. Well, there was terrible famine in the early 20s in Samara, and that's one of the first big um, national, uh, international emergencies that involved Save the Children, which was new, newly established, and people went out with Save the Children, the new, new fund to help these poor people starving to death in, in southern Russia. Yes, absolutely. So after, okay, so you're going to write this book on um, the Romanovs, and then do you have, like, any plans, or do you just let them kind of fall in? in a heap. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to write this new book very, very fast, because we want it to come out just before the 100th anniversary of the Romanov murders next year which is July 1918. Oh, I have right. to deliver it by November. I am going to be working absolutely full steam ahead. I've just about completed the research, and I'm just going to get my head down. I'm coming to America for um, to do a, one last bit of research and to do a few talks in April. I'm coming to Washington briefly and then uh, New York. And oh. in between that and, and attending literature festivals, because there's quite a... Um, a flourishing literary festival circuit here in the UK. I'll be going on that circuit on an awful all from spring to autumn. Between that, um, I'm just going to be beavering away like crazy to get the next book done. Well, I can't. I, you know, if there's any way to let me know when you are going to be here, I will definitely put it out there because I'm sure. A lot of people would love to see you speak. I would, I, and if you're going to be on the East Coast, I'm, I'm definitely going to try to see you. So. Well, unfortunately, I've only got four talks this time. I did a, a two-week, well, actually three-week trip last year and went to both coasts. This year, I'll be speaking at Hillwood Museum in Washington, uh, and you can see it on their website. You can also see my dates um, on your website on my, on my news and events page. I'm doing a talk at the Mid Manhattan branch in New York Public Library, mm -hmm. and um, I'm actually doing an event for Victoria um, at the Rizzoli Bookstore in um, near Broadway, I think, in New York. I'm also doing two private clubs, but I'm not allowed to advertise it. Uh, is this going to be at the? Did you say it would be at the end of this year or beginning of next year? No, no, April. I'm oh, you're going to do it in um, April. Wow. I'll be okay. uh, I'll be speaking at Hillwood Museum on the twentieth of April. It's on my on their website. They've got a big page about it. And I'll be uh, speaking at Mid Manhattan New York New York Public Library branch. Um I can't remember offhand, but it's sometime the following week. Okay. I didn't realize it was gonna be this that's awesome. So that's coming up and I will definitely uh, and the word out. bookstore day it's down there on my website as well. If people yeah. look for my website news and events there's a list of all the events i'm doing this year i'm also doing radio and i'm going to be recording a second um, talking head for a documentary about the revolution um uh, and also very excitingly for me um working with a production company who have opted the rights to one of my other books <laughs> called television which i'm absolutely thrilled about Oh, that is awesome. And I do love your documentaries. I love watching you on those. Uh, oh, well, you know. thank you. Well, <laughs> I, I've just done one for Netflix on the Russian Revolution, and I'm going to be doing something else for BBC on the Russian Revolution and BBC Radio and anything else that comes up. I mean, I'm here if people want me to... Um, sit there and say something i will <laughs> that's right and i will be linking your website for people who want to look at your schedule and see what's coming up so we will be yeah, linking if you could that just link video. if you could link to my website and say they can follow me as helen rapaport writer on facebook i've got an open page in which i talk and do little mini blogs about my work and like this stuff i've just posted about my 
PR trip, um, my speaking trip to Amsterdam last week. Um, and on Twitter, I'm Helen Rappaport on Twitter as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Helen. It's been so much fun talking to you about these books. I learned. Well, you're very welcome, you know. um, <laughs> if, ever I come, if ever I come to Philadelphia, I'll let you know. <laughs> yes, thank you. So, I, and, and if I see you, I'll, you know, I'll definitely try to come up to you and introduce myself. So, well, please will... do, please do. But, um, you know, um, if if you ever want to ask me anything more, just email me. If there's any any more details you need. Okay. And, um, I'm I'm just to say I'm really looking forward to coming back to the states. I really yeah. loved being yeah. there last year. Oh, awesome! So I'm, I'm excited you. about coming back. And and we will continue to read your book, so you just keep writing. Well, thank you very we'll much. Just continue I, to read. I do hope you enjoy the new book. It means a lot to me because one of the things I want to stress, and maybe you could stress it somehow, I don't know, if you write something about this this new book, is that people will be very surprised at how many Americans are in the story who they have never heard of. Because I suspect that most Americans even well-educated Americans who've read some history will probably only have heard of John Reed, who wrote, wrote Ten Days That Shook the World. And, you know, I then will. there was the Warren, Warren Beatty film, Reds. Yes, I will, definitely, I will definitely put a little blurb in about that because we so don't know. I think, that I think people will be fascinated yes. to see the cross-section of Americans who were there who witnessed the revolution because I don't think the average American reader has any idea that there are all these Americans in the city. Absolutely uh, not. And Phil Jordan, that wasn't by no means the only black guy. They had a, a former boxer who was who was black, who was the, the sort of the security bouncer on the door of the American embassy. And he taught boxing in Petrograd and stayed on after the revolution. In fact, I can't find out what happened to him. He might have spent the rest rest of his life there for all I know. So mm-hmm. there are some fascinating stories of totally unsung Americans, some of whom were actually quite heroic. That's awesome. Thank you so much for all of your work. We really You're very know. welcome. I, we that love and, this um, Can love you let me work. know as soon as it's up? And I will let... Um, um, did this come through HarperCollins or St. Martin's? I can't remember. Did you contact me through which publisher no, was I, it? No, it wasn't a publisher. I just contacted you. Oh, on it was own. me direct. Your website, yep. Okay, sorry, I forgot because a lot of stuff comes through yeah. publishers. No, anyway, sure. I will tell the publishers for Victoria Book and also for Caution the Rev, and they will try and link and tweet about it as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful day. Well, you're very day. welcome. And uh, all the best to you, Michelle. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye.